Hello, hello everybody. This is uh, 2016, Calculus A, B, and B, C. Problem number three. It's a graphical analysis. They give us a function g that we have to be aware of. This is just f. And so they want to know if g has a relative minimum, maximum, or neither at x equals 10. So first of all, we should all know that first we have to make sure there's a critical point. So we need the derivative of g to see if there's gonna be a critical point. Ooh, that too fat. There we go, that's probably better. Yeah. So this is where you need to be careful. So g prime of x, we are using the fundamental theorem of calculus. So I wanna highlight something or point something out here. So remember, when you're taking the derivative of an integral, and the bottom's a constant, and the top is the variable you're dealing with, and it is x is our variable, it says all you do is plug x in for t. Now, if this variable on top wasn't a variable, but a function like x squared or sine x, you still plug it in, but by the chain rule, you have to multiply by the derivative of that. But that's not the case here, because it's just x. So that would just be f of x. So we want to know what g prime at 10 is. It better be 0 or undefined, or you would not have a critical point, therefore not a relative max or min. So we want to find f at 10. And if you look, I will use a prettier color right there. F of 10 is 0. So that is 0. First step complete. Now we need to find the derivative to the left and right of that. So we're going to make a little table. Bam. There's 10. So it's kind of like a number line. You want a point to the left of 10. Now you can't go past 6 because you can't go past the next critical point or the end point. So it has to be between those. So 8 is a pretty number between those. So I shall choose 8. And to the right, a number between 10 and 12, I like 11. What's g prime? Well, g prime is f. f at 8 is clearly negative down here. And at 11, it's clearly negative there. So there is not a sign change. So clearly, there is neither a relative max or min. So we will say g of x has neither a rel max or rel min at x equals 10. Why? Because g prime of x does not change signs. Oops. Does not change signs. Siggins at x equal 10. Dano parteo. Let's go to part b o. Does G have an inflection point? So if you know your justifications, you should think immediately, what is the justification for an inflection point? That's the second derivative changing signs. So we better find the second derivative. So looking at our first derivative here, we would just take the derivative of the derivative to get the second derivative. And so we get G double prime of X equals F prime of X. So we wanna know if G is Double prime is positive or negative? Well, if we know if f prime is positive or negative, that will tell us if g double prime is positive or negative. And we've done this many, many, many times. But let's do this. Let's go with green. So how do we know if f prime is positive or f prime is negative? Well, that's the other justification that we should all be experts, champions at, at this time in our calculus careers. So if f is increasing, we should know f prime is 
positive. If f is decreasing, f prime is negative. So let's highlight all these in green where f is increasing. So in those three regions, f is increasing. Therefore, let me erase these other dots. Therefore, f prime is positive. So I'm going to state that. And this is regarding all the green. This is scratch work for you to see what's going on. So clearly, f is increasing on all these green regions. That implies that f prime, which is g double prime, is positive. That implies that g is concave up. So all that stuff I just wrote, I need to write it in words. So we'll get to that. Now, red for, I think of red as owing and negative. So, in the regions here, F is decreasing on all those regions. So, I will write that out. So, this is our thinking. F is, did I say increasing or decreasing? I can't even remember. I should have said decreasing. If f is decreasing, we know that f prime, which is g double prime, would be negative, which implies g is concave down. And so the inflection points occur where it changes from the green to the red that we have there. So that's what I'm going to state next. So we just have to write that out. So we're going to say, we're going through, let's look at this green line. So I'm going to do this line in English. F is increasing where? On a bunch of intervals from negative 4 to 0 and 2 to 4 and 8 to 10. Therefore, what happens because of that? F prime, which is G double prime, is positive. On those intervals. And the last conclusion, therefore, G is concave up. on those intervals. I'm going to run out of room here. That's the, okay. So next, I'm going to do the red line. Maybe I should be following colors here since that last one's green. I'm going to do the exact same thing as I just did here, except this. That's what I'm doing. So I'm going to say F is decreasing on three intervals, 0 to 2, whoopsies, 0 to 2, and then, let's show what's going on, 4 to 8 in this interval, and the last interval from 10 to 12, it's decreasing, therefore, F prime, which is G double prime, is negative. I should say on those intervals. It should have a period there. On those intervals. Okay. Therefore, G is concave down on those intervals. All right, our final conclusion. Since we have the regions where f double prime is positive and f double prime is negative, clearly, clearly, at those purple highlighted points, we can state our conclusion. At those points, that's where the second derivative changes from positive to negative. So my final conclusion, therefore, G has 
inflection points at, okay, what did it ask for? Does a graph of, oh my gosh! Do you see what I just did? I'm such a lame-ho. I'm so sad. Die so! So, okay. Wow, what a, yeah. You can call me whatever you want. Okay, what I did is not wrong. I just have way too much info. So, yeah. Look, they just want to know what's happening at four. So everything I said about this region and this region is not necessary. So all that would change. Well, here's what I would, I'm not gonna erase it. I'm just gonna highlight what I don't need. Here's what I don't need. I don't need negative four to zero. So I wouldn't need that. Whoa, 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 whoa. Yeah, I'll just do a line. I wouldn't need that, and I wouldn't need 8 to 10. And then, similarly, I wouldn't need, for the decreasing, I wouldn't need the 0 to 2, and I wouldn't need the 10 to 12. But everything else is legit. I just did too much, too many regions. So I don't need to do all that. So... Even if you left that there, it's not wrong, but you're just doing extra work. So G has an inflection point at X equals four because, and the justification, G double prime changes signs at X equals four. Done. That is par B. Now let's move on to part C. So for part C, we'll do down here. It's asking for, let me highlight it. It's asking for an absolute minimum, an absolute maximum. So you should know those occur at critical points and endpoints. So let me draw a quick picture so you can remember this. So if I draw a graph on a closed interval, you'll see the max occurs at that right endpoint and the min occurs at the left endpoint. But I can draw another function and the max occurs at a critical point and the min occurs at a critical point. So max and mins of a continuous function on a closed interval occur at critical points or endpoints. So those are the only places you have to look. So for part C, we have, let's see, is this for G? So we need to know, find the critical points. That occurs when G prime of X equals zero, and that happens at, so remember, G prime of X is F of X. So if you want, let's do this so your brain follows better. G prime of X, which equals F of X, equals zero at, and it occurs at negative 2, 2, 6, and 10. But, let's see, I think we're good. Yeah. At x equals negative 2, 2, 6, and 10. So to find the max or min, we'd have to find the value of g at all those points plus the endpoints. And it's not going to be as ugly as you think. Now, you could argue at negative 2, you have a relative minimum. So, um, actually, you want the minimum and max, so that's okay. We have relative min here. At 2, you have neither relative min or max, so that couldn't be an absolute maximum. So, you could ignore 2 if you make that argument. 6, you have a rel max. Again, at 10, you could ignore 10 because at 10, you don't have a relative max or min, so it can't be an absolute max or min. So you could ignore 10 and 2. So for time reasons, you would have to kind of argue that and explain why you don't need those. I'm going to skip those two just to make this problem go faster. I'm sure you guys would like this problem to go faster. So I need to find the value of g at the left endpoint, the value of g at the two critical points I have left, and the value g at the right endpoint, 12. 
and I might fast forward a little bit, but we need to know a starting value of g and an ending value of g. Okay, actually we don't. So here's the formula for g. We have it right here. This is the formula for g. So we need g at negative 4. That's going to be the integral from 2 to negative 4 of f of t dt. We can find that pretty quickly. So we're going from 2 to negative 4. Now, to make this go really fast, it actually makes it pretty easy. The area of that triangle, the base is 2, the height is 4. So the area, that's 4. Actually, all these triangles have area of 4. That's going to make our life much easier. It'll make this integral really easy to find. So the integral from 2 to negative 4, we're going here backwards. So the integral from negative 4 to 2 would be the net area, which is 4. But since you're going backwards, it would be a negative 4. Now, you would do the same process for all of these. So I will do one more of these. And then after this, I'm just going to put the answers. You can double check. We're going from 2 to negative 2. And I probably should put the actual function here. I'll just do these. It won't take that long. So 2 to negative 2. We're going backwards this way. The integral would be 8, but since we're going backwards, it will be negative 8. And then for g of 6, I'm not going to write the function down. We're going from 2 to 6. The integral from 2 to 6, the net area would be 8, so that's answer will be 8. And for g of 12, we're going from 2 to 12. It's going to be 8 minus 8 minus 4. That's going to be negative 4. So let's take a look. They want the absolute maximum value and the absolute minimum value. So they don't want where the x-coordinate is. They want the actual maximum minimum value. So the maximum would be 8, and the minimum would be negative 8. So you would have to make a final statement. G has a maximum value. of 8 and a minimum value of 8 on the interval negative 4. It's actually a closed interval, so I should put brackets. That's it. We're done with C. One more to go. And this one, let's take a look here. Let me... Part D, what do we want? We want to know when G is negative. Find the intervals. So for this, let me write this down. G of X is negative when. So let's look at what G of X is. We have it here. So we're going to have to just, in our head, process through this. So we're starting at 2. So we're starting here. Now, if I go to the left, it's net area, but it's opposite. Since all of this is above, the integral would normally be positive. But as I move this way, I'm moving backwards, so it's going to be negative. So it's, when I get from here to here, my integral will be to a negative 8. As I keep going past negative 2, since it's below and it's opposite, I'm going to start adding that. But if I add 4 to negative 8, I never get positive. So we will be negative all the way in this whole region from negative 4 to 2. So let me write that down on and actually at the endpoints would be included, but at 2 would be 0. So I shouldn't put an equal sign at 2, although the solution has that. I don't know why. Oh, they have less than or equal to 0. Oh, okay. I didn't catch that. 
equal to zero. So I want to include two because we're zero at two. Now, as I move to the right, let's do a different color here. As I move to the right from here to here, it's the net area. So the integral at the end of this point is eight. Starts at zero and goes to eight. So it's always positive. As I continue moving to the right, I start subtracting the area. And so if I have 8 and I subtract 8, at this point, I'm back to 0. As I continue moving past that, I continue subtracting. So all the way from 10 to 12, we're going to have negative values. So I'm going to go from 10 all the way to 12. And that's my answer. That's it for this problem. Bye.